So hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today's briefing on the Israeli case for a permanent ceasefire. My name is Odelia Mader. I'm an Israeli-American and the program assistant for Middle East policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, in our last briefing in this series, we heard panelists discuss the implications of invoking Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act and the importance of examining unconditional military assistance to Israel as the war in Gaza continues. If you missed it, you can watch it via the link that Kayvon will send in this Zoom's chat right now. Um, and we can begin by marking that today, the war in Gaza has reached its five month anniversary. And in five months, um, Israel has not reached its declared goals for this war. While over 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, over 1,370 Israelis have been killed, and over 130 hostages remain in Gaza. The UN estimates the vast majority of Gaza's population are on the brink of famine. While prominent epidemiologists estimate that an escalation of the war could cause up to 85,000 Palestinian deaths over the next six months due to injuries, disease, and lack of medical care. While the Biden administration has indicated support for current negotiations for a temporary ceasefire ahead of what would be an extremely deadly offensive in Rafah, panelists will discuss from an Israeli perspective why a permanent ceasefire is the only viable way to, secu to a secure and just future for the region. I note that after a recent trip that I took to Israel to visit my family and friends, I learned of a five-month-old cultural trend among Israelis when seeing each other for the first time in a while by asking, where were you on October 7th? I'll ask that each panelist begin their remarks by answering this difficult question briefly. Our panelists today are three established women with Israeli citizenship. We have Aida Tuma Sliman, current Israeli Knesset member representing the joint Arab Jewish party Hadash, Ziv Shtal, executive director of Yeshdin, and Tanya Hari, executive director of Gisha. After their first remarks, we'll proceed to a Q&A section where we'll be addressing questions sent via the registration for this um, briefing. If you have further questions, feel free to use the Q&A function in the Zoom, and we will try to address those questions. So we'll start with Tanya Hari, um, who is the Executive Director of Gisha, which is the Legal Center for Freedom of Movement, an Israeli human rights organization which promotes the right to movement in the Palestinian territories, especially Gaza. Prior to joining Gisha in 2007, Tanya worked on advocacy initiatives for not-for-profit organizations promoting human rights and development. Tanya was born in Haifa, raised in Los Angeles, and now resides in Tel Aviv, Yaffa. So Tanya, I'll ask that you answer the difficult question first of where you were on October 7th, and how did the day's events affect you? Um, thanks so much for, for hosting this and to those who've joined the call. Um, so in a minute, you're going to hear from Zeev and where she was on October 7th. Uh, Zeev and I are good friends, and I'll say that um, uh, that really terrible morning, uh, I woke up to, uh, to learn uh, that Zeev was um, in her family's home um, in the Gaza uh, region and uh, the Gaza envelope, as you say, I guess a translation from Hebrew. Um, and I spent much of the day very worried about her uh, safety and also um, very worried just generally about the region. I think uh, being somebody who has worked on this um, in this intersection of uh, Israeli and Palestinian life, uh, specifically where it crosses at Gaza for um, the past 16 years, I have obviously uh, many loved ones in Israel and also now loved ones in Gaza. And so the um, horrors of that day were coupled with a kind of, um, you know, a, a horror at what was to come. And I'm afraid to say that those uh, sort of terrible nightmares are coming true now. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I wanted to ask um, that you describe uh, describe briefly how the work at Gisha looked like previous to this war and how it has changed since the war began. Um, and then why you think a permanent ceasefire is a step to ensure that former status quo in Gaza that you had been working within 
does not repeat itself. Sure. Um, so uh, before October 7th, Gisha was representing about a thousand people per year in direct legal assistance. So that was to help people get permits to, to travel, to move goods. Um, and we were doing legal and public advocacy more broadly on issues related to access, trying to change policy and sort of change the situation more broadly as it related to access. And also, I would say importantly, um, garner greater accountability for the way that Israeli authorities were affecting life in Gaza, trying to get them to adhere to what their obligations are according to Israeli and international law. Um, after October 7th, as most of you know, all of Gaza's crossings were initially closed, electricity was uh, shut off, uh, the water supply was shut off, aid was even blocked for several weeks. Um, and there have been, of course, some shifts in that in that policy, as we know, so some uh, uh, aid started coming in first through Rafah with uh, Egypt, the Rafah crossing with Egypt, later through Karim Shalom crossing. Um, some partial water supply was restored, some exit of people via Egypt is being allowed, um, but it's severely limited just to uh, people who have been injured, who have coordination to cross, uh, people with foreign citizenship who are um, being evacuated by foreign governments, and then of course this special coordination, people paying a lot of money um, uh, to, to get out, we can talk about that later. Um, but overall, obstacles to aid are, of course, still in place. Um, access to the north remains blocked. Electricity is still shut off. So I would say at the moment, you know, post October 7th, um, one of the main things that we're focusing on is understanding the obstacles um, to aid access and also um, trying to increase uh, humanitarian access. Um, we are also handling some uh, still individual legal assistance cases, people who are being security blocked from exiting via RAFA, so that's evacuations of foreign uh, nationals. Um, also, thanks to our legal assistance, over 100 people uh, with Israeli citizenship, so Palestinian citizens of Israel who were residing in Gaza or visiting uh, the Gaza Strip um, prior to October 7th, they have now been evacuated. At first, the state didn't agree to do those evacuations, and um, uh, thanks to our legal assistance together with our partner, Hamel Ked, um, more than 100 people have been evacuated. And we're still doing principled work on a number of issues, including uh, access to the North um, and, uh, you know, more generally speaking about Israel's obligations to allow access, including restoring electricity and water supply. Um, I would say to the bigger question, you know, in many ways, everything has changed. It feels like we're working in two different organizations. Um, and in others, I'd say that what we're seeing now is really just the most extreme version of trends uh, that we saw before that were long in place. Um, unfortunately, I think that some in the Israeli government really see uh, in the uh, horrendous uh, um, you know, events of October 7th an opportunity to do what they wanted to do prior, which was to cut Gaza off permanently, um, to you know, rid Gaza of its residents, uh, even to resettle the territory. I mean, these things that were once sort of outlandish and and fringe are you know sort of front stage right now with uh, this this government. So I think there are many many reasons why we need a ceasefire right now, to including to get the hostages out um, and to prevent a further unraveling of the humanitarian catastrophe. Um, it's the only way aid can be delivered effectively, but I think it's also because we need to stop uh, these sort of outlandish political fantasies um, from coming true and restore, um, or maybe not even restore, but sort of set the, the region on a path to a, a different kind of future. We can't just go back to how things were before. We really need a vision for a new kind of reality um, based on, on principles of justice. Um, on equality and, and safety really for everyone in this region. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I appreciate uh, your, your words and experience as well. Um, and next we'll hear from Ziv Stahl, who is the executive director of Yeshtin, uh, Volunteers for Human Rights. This is an Israeli organization working to protect human rights of Palestinians in the West Bank by documenting, collecting, and disseminating 
reliable and updated information regarding systematic human rights violations in the occupied Palestinian territories. She holds a master's degree in political science from Tel Aviv University. Uh, and Ziv is also a member of the board of directors of Akivot Institute for the study of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I'd like to ask you, Ziv, the difficult question of where you were on October 7th and how you were affected by the day's um, horrific events. Uh, so I think Tanya already uh, said, uh, I was born and raised in Kfar Aza, which is a kibbutz uh, near Gaza. Uh, I moved to Tel Aviv yeah, for uh, some 20 years ago, but uh, my almost my entire family lived there. I have two siblings with their families and my dad. My, my mom passed really four months before October 7th. Uh, so I arrived uh, to the kibbutz, uh, it was a holiday, uh, to visit my family, stay with them. I arrived the day before, on the 6th, uh, and I was uh, sleeping at my sister's house uh, with her family. Uh, and this is where I was, actually, when it all started. Uh, I won't go, go into all the details of what happened, I'll just say maybe a few quick things. So. Uh, we were in the safe room, locked in, or not locked, but uh, kept in the safe room for 14 hours uh, before we were evacuated, and evacuated eventually from the area a total of 18 hours just uh, in, uh, in Saturday night. Uh, most of the time we were in the safe room, we had to uh, treat uh, young, very young, 20 years old, uh, wounded, uh, person, he was, he is my uh, niece's boyfriend, and they ran to save their life from the uh, neighborhood of the young people in Faraza, which was almost entirely uh, destroyed. And actually, still four people from there are still kept hostage in Gaza. Uh, so he, they came and he was shot in both arms, and we uh, had to take care of him because no one else came. Um, and my uh, brother's wife, my sister-in-law, uh, was murdered during, during the events. We didn't know that at the time. We knew that she's not answering the phone and cannot get a hold of her. My brother and their kids weren't home that day, so uh, she was alone at home with the dogs. Uh, and I don't know if... American people know that, but uh, the kibbutz is very uh, close community. Everyone knows each other. So a lot of people who were close to me, who raised me up during my childhood, uh, are gone. Uh, more than 60 people from the kibbutz in total. Five are still in Gaza as we speak. Uh, so that's where I was during that day. Ziv. Uh, infinite thank you for sharing this and um, I think it speaks multitudes um, I, I want to divert people's attention if you have time to read an incredible piece that Ziv wrote about her experience in the chat of this Zoom and how indiscriminate bombings um, are not the solution to what thousands and thousands of Israelis face that day um, and I, I wanted to ask you you know, I'm sure after this experience, I've seen that Yeshdin has been extremely fruitful and very, very busy in this period. So I wanted to ask that considering your extensive work in the West Bank, how the war in Gaza has affected that region, and then why a permanent ceasefire could provide further security for both Israelis and Palestinians. So I'll just say that personally, I took some time off before uh, going back to work. and uh, My dear colleagues, uh, operated on my absence very well. Uh, I, I think we can say a few things about what's going on in the West Bank right now. Uh, two of the more significant things are that there are huge uh, roadblocks uh, within the West Bank and the entire West Bank is actually, I would say, blocked. It's very hard to move from one place to another. Some villages are totally uh, sealed with uh, uh, no ability to to leave the, the village or the town and even the big cities. And some other places, it's the main roads that are blocked for uh, Palestinians to enter. 
there are a lot of new checkpoints, but not only checkpoints, it's also a pile of dirt or uh, uh, chunks of uh, concrete that uh, the army puts on the road in order to prevent Palestinians from moving from one place to, the, to another. This, of course, affects the life of millions uh, in a very dramatic way because once you prevent the right for, to move around, uh, you basically prevent a lot of other rights such as education and health, access to uh, almost everything that is uh, what consists normal life for people. Uh, so even though those who can leave their villages or towns uh, have to go around, like find another road, which takes a very, very long time to get from one place to another. To another. We're entering uh, Ramadan month in the end of this week. So that will also affect the ability of people to meet their families and uh, to mention the, hol the holiday. Another thing that we are seeing is uh, a very uh, dramatic increase in settler violence. Uh, I think we should look at it not only since the beginning of the war, because uh, as we all know, there is always something before. So uh, this is a trend that started with the new government. So we can see uh, the numbers in the entire year of 2023 uh, got really high. But it's not only the number of incidents, it's also the severity of the incidents and the number of settlers who participate in them. So even before the war, we've seen uh, incidents with hundreds of uh, settlers who attack one village or a few villages during the night. And we've seen that also after the war with other incidents as well. So violence uh, from uh, settlers increased dramatically during the war uh, and before that, uh, alongside with uh, almost no law enforcement by Israeli police and military. I would say even on the contrary, uh, we've seen more and more, and during the war it's even gotten worse, that soldiers not, are not only standing idly by and doing nothing to stop settler violence, they actually participate or encourage them and help them, and for sure, sure giving them uh, the, um, the security or the defense in order, in order for them to be able to enter villages or to clash with uh, Palestinians. Uh, we also seen something new in this war, which is settlers which are in uniforms. And then it's very hard to differentiate between soldiers and settlers. Some of this is because all of the security uh, spots in the settlements are now in reserve and they are wearing uniform, uniforms and they have much more authority because of that. Uh, but some of them we actually don't know because they were some... Uh, part of the uniform, but not entirely, and we actually don't know whether we are talking about uh, a settler who just wore some part of the uniform and is not uh, in reserve, but now he acts as if he is, uh, and that allows them to do uh, a lot more uh, in regards to uh, chasing Palestinians away from their lands and many other uh, violent acts. Uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that uh, more than 16 uh, Palestinian Bedouin communities were actually chased out, out of their land and displaced because of settler violence and state violent, violence during the war. Uh, again, this is something that began before the war with uh, the shepherding outposts uh, in very um, very big scale. That This is kind of a new phenomenon of the past few years in the West Bank, you have a new uh, method of taking over Palestinian land, a lot of Palestinian land, basically by creating a very small outpost with probably one or two families and some volunteers, and by grazing the land with your sheep or uh, goats, and then this is a way to chase Palestinians, you run into the Palestinians in the land, and you uh, commit a violent, violent acts, acts and threats in order for them to be scared to uh, come to the land, they usually graze their sheep. And also by uh, having your sheep eating all the, the herb in the graze land, so they, the sheep has nothing to eat. Uh, but this has increased during the war and, and caused uh, uh, many uh, Palestinian communities to actually leave their home, either to towns nearby or to areas uh, that are further away uh, in the east. 
And this is something very worrying because it's getting, uh, I would say, more and more severe uh, in the, during the war and during the time that no one looked at what's going on in the West Bank. And maybe uh, just another uh, important point uh, of what's going on in the West Bank, uh, while we are all watching what's happening in Gaza, and rightfully so, uh, settlers are not uh, not resting. So we have seen a lot of annexation uh, steps taken by the government, and uh, settlers on the ground take more uh, Palestinian land, but not only that, also to promote uh, I would say more of um, infrastructure and um, legal framework steps in order to promote the annexation. I find it hard to say to promote the annexation because I feel it's already there and we keep saying it's uh, getting to be an annexation. I think we are already there, but it is a process uh, and it's getting worse all the time. So uh, this is part of what's being done. Uh, while uh, uh, I can say in my kibbutz, no one uh, even evacuated the ruin of the houses that were uh, burned or uh, demolished. And no one started any new construction for those who lost their homes. In the settlements, Smotrich approves many house, housing resident uh, units and uh, uh, confiscation of more lands so, and declaration of state lands. So uh, the government finds the budget and the time to work on that, which is very uh, disturbing. Uh, also from a personal point of view, but uh, of course, uh, from a total point of view. Uh, and in general, we've seen a lot of states taking, and I would say the most worrying thing is the fact that settlers and settlers in the government are now talking about really building the settlements in the Gaza Strip which is something that is very, very dangerous and very uh, worrying. Um, you mentioned the article I wrote after the after the 7th of October. I wrote it a week after. I think I was still uh, unaware of what's going on or what is the discourse within uh, Israel. So I didn't think it, I'm writing something so different or even brave. It was only after it was published that I got responses from people telling me, depends on what side. So some, some told me I was very brave to write it, and some, of course, uh, didn't think so, or thought I was stupid to write it, or even uh, worse than that. Uh, but I think uh, it's really important to understand that from uh, where we see things, or I see things, uh, more revenge, more violence cannot lead to anything good. And if we all want to live in this area, and I think we all want to live, or most of us, we have to come up with a political solution for this problem. And using more force is not the, the solution. And of course, as uh, some who represent CHDN, which is a human rights organization, we see what's going on in Gaza, and even if you can justify, uh, legally speaking, or international law, legally speaking, uh, the beginning of the war in Gaza, or the fact that Israel felt she has to protect its uh, citizens, what Israel is doing, the way she it conducts the war, is cannot be justified in any way in international law. We have, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, so much destruction, so much, so much uh, fatalities that it's beyond any reason, conduct, or for sure um, war crimes are, are being committed. And I think this is why we all feel very strongly that this must end and the ceasefire is really urgent. Thank you so much. Uh, what a thoughtful answer. And I also wanted to point folks on this call towards um, links to Gisha and Yeshdin's websites where you can read the reports, documentation of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, as well as the developments that Ziv just mentioned in the West Bank that I think are really important to see, as you'd mentioned, not just as um, uh, pointed events and occurrences, but part of a larger scale uh, pattern in the region. Um, so thank you so much. And um, next we'll hear from MK Aida Tuma Sliman, 
Uh, Aida is a member of Knesset representing Hadash, Hadash, the Democratic Front for Peace and Equality, an Arab Jewish party. She was first elected in 2015 and served as the first Arab chair of the Knesset Statutory Committee for the Status of Women and Gender Equality till 2022. MK Tuma Sliman was the first woman to serve in the high follow-up committee for Arab citizens of Israel and is co-founder of the IWC, International Women Commission for Just Palestinian Israeli Peace. She is also a secretary member of the World Peace Council. So Aida, thank you so much for joining us today. And I wanted to ask you what I'd asked Tanya and Ziv, which is how you were affected by October 7th events. Thank you. Thank you, Dalia. And I'm, uh, I have to say I'm still under uh, the uh, effect of Zeev's uh, uh, description and horrible uh, event that she had to go through. Um, I think that uh, uh, you said, uh, Zeev, that uh, you wrote uh, your piece when you were still under the a trauma and under the events of the uh, effect of the events, I think all of us are still un, uh, going through a trauma. Uh, most of us uh, did not uh, have even the chance to recover from the trauma of the 7th of October because the everyday trauma that is happening in Gaza and the fact that we are following what is happening there with a lot of um, uh, sorrow, pain, and and uh, feeling of helplessness that just a few kilometers from us, uh, people uh, are suffering from femine, and, and we have as if to continue our lives as normal, uh, and this is an absurd. Um, on the 7th of October, I was, um, like every day, uh, getting up early, um, immediately putting on TV, uh, to hear the news. If you are living in uh, this region, you understand that you might miss a lot if you sleep for four or five uh, hours, even if you do not expect a horrible event like the 7th of October. Um, and I immediately started following uh, what was going on in the beginning. We, underst we didn't understand that it's such a huge uh, uh, event uh, and that there are horrible things happening. But I, I, Yanni, and I, like Tanya, I had friends who were staying um, uh, with their families in the kibbutzim, and I, I called part of them. Of course, they couldn't answer because they were texting. They were saying that they can, um, Yanni, uh, hear the voices of the Hamas people in their um, houses. That's why they are texting. Um, I don't want to go through a lot of details because actually I live very far in the north and I um, I watched what was happening from far. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, if you ask me how the 7th of October affected me, before the 7th of October, I believed very much that um, occupation and siege and suffering of people in the West Bank and in Gaza cannot continue like this. And that the deterioration that we are seeing in front of us, it explains very much or warn us that some there will be an explosion coming. And we've been warning from that. It's not because we knew what is planned, but logic and better understanding of the situation, we understood that there will be an explosion. Before the 7th of October, I, I've I always believed that there is no military solution. And now more than ever, even, I understand that there is no military solution and wars cannot bring anything, uh, uh, any security for anybody. It's very clear for me even uh, more than uh, ever, as much as Israel was strong military-wise, uh, and, and and economically um, uh, in its relation with the Palestinians on the other uh, uh, side, it could not protect its citizens from the horrible events of the 7th of October. But we have to also understand 7th of October, there is 
uh, a tendency even among the Israeli government and sometimes all over the world to speak about it as it is the beginning of all uh, uh, the conflict. It is not a beginning. It's a horrible junction in, in what we have been uh, living. And it is a result and it is a base for a continuation. And we have to be, uh, yani, uh, understand that very uh, well. Uh, occupation existed before the seventh, and and the uh, siege existed, as my colleagues has explained. And horrible death of Palestinians happened. Yet I'm saying it very clearly: none of the crimes that were committed before the seventh of October legitimize even uh, the death of one child or the murder of one child on the seventh of October. And of course, not kidnapping civilians. Uh, and what happened, the horrible things that happened on the 7th of October will never legitimize the, the, the crimes that are committed since then in the last five uh, months. There is no way to think about uh, uh, that. I have to say that it, if, if there is something that I'm affected uh, uh, by the events of the 7th is believing more than ever that uh, 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 there is only one solution, which is a political agreeable solution, that there is no way to secure anybody as long as you know, there is no way to secure the occupier as long those who are under occupation are not secured. Uh, we are uh, we, we are uh, interrelated into each other, the Palestinians and the uh, Israelis. There is no one side that can live happily while the other are suffering. And we have to understand very clearly that. Aida, thank you so much. I think it's a really important distinction to make that often the 7th of October is treated as a ground zero for the rest of the war, the conflict, the, the way forward. And I appreciate you pointing towards a long history that um, that came previous to, to that horrific day. And I wanted to ask you um, next, considering your position from within the Knesset, what do you see, what are you noticing is actually motivating the Israeli government in its current actions? And how is the war affecting current Israeli legislation? And after you address that, I'd also like to ask why you think a permanent ceasefire is the most strategic way forward for this government. Well, um, thank you uh, for asking, because actually we have been uh, uh, witnessing a huge shift in the Israeli, not only gov uh, uh, government, there is no shift. This government has been horrible before the 7th of October. It's escalating in after the 7th. But there is a shift also among the Israeli society that is a little bit uh, uh, scaring me uh, and other Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. And of course, the democratic forces. I, and today you are meeting three women, uh, uh, two, I should say, very courageous, Ziv and Tanya, because they are really standing up against the general consensus in Israel. But you have to take into your consideration, we are not the majority and we are not the mainstream in Israel. And we are a minority and the uh, situation now, the government is leading a real attack and trying to crack down all the voices that are against the war and that are demanding a political uh, solution or revealing the crimes that are committed also uh, in Gaza and in the West Bank. This government, I have to say, uh, uh, had its plans from before the 7th of October. Actually, its practices and over the years had led us to this situation. Uh, and uh, 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 now they have the um, uh, they feel that after the big support that was given by the world, especially the U.S. Ad, uh, administration to Israel and the slogan that Israel have the right to defend itself, 
and the fact that it is, uh, 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 although there are some criticisms sometimes coming from the uh, American administration or European countries, but it's, it's still getting all the military, financial, and moral, and political support by the world. For, for this government, this is an opportunity. The uh, Israeli society is, is angry, is uh, sad, uh, uh, in a, um, and I think it's uh, it's a total legitimate feeling after the seventh October. They can build up on this, on these feelings. They kidnap the feelings of the Israeli society and turn it into a kind of revenge uh, a war. Just in the first two days, three days, continuing that was uh, a very political, thoughtful uh, 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 plan for this war. The war is going to uh, liquidate, the, in my opinion, what is not declared by the Israeli government is the goal to liquidate any possibility for uh, implementing the right of, of self-determination for the Palestinians or being liberated from occupation. Uh, uh, there is ethnic cleansing going on in Gaza and in the West Bank, and we have to be very clear about it. Why I'm saying this? Because this Israeli government, they had 12 ministers uh, uh, participating in a conference that were, was held in Jerusalem uh, uh, for uh, resettling in Gaza building settlements in Gaza. 12 ministers of this government participated in this conference, which is clearly says, you know, you go back to the um, a, a Jewish nation state law. Article one says that the, the greater land of Israel is uh, uh, the land of the Jewish people. And Article 2 says there will not, the, the right of self-determination uh, uh, will be solely for the Jewish people in this land. Meaning this is, this is the vision this government and the right wing in Israel is holding. And that's why they are pushing this war more and more. Asking for, us, and, and they are, of course, continuing legislations that are meant, first of all, to oppress any of the voices who will stand up against these uh, uh, attempts or uh, the war uh, uh, implications, and of and laws and legislations that are uh, 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 very uh, uh, oppressive against the Palestinian people under the uh, uh, claim of security uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and I think that uh, when we are demanding a, cease, uh, a permanent ceasefire, because we understand that the time was always the name of Netanyahu's goal, using the time to create new facts on the ground and new reality on the ground. Everybody liked to speak about the day after. The day after of what? The day after is creating is created today, is designed today. If we continue to be silent, then uh, and if there won't be in a permanent and immediate ceasefire, we will wake up in the day after where is it, where is there are settlements already started to be built in Gaza, and the occupation will become colonialism forever. We need to act now because also uh, uh, for political reasons, but also for human reasons. Yani, I don't understand how the world can continue and the different governments can continue uh, uh, while people are facing famine and, and, and murder every day. More than 12,000 children are killed in Gaza. And I, I assume that there are more numbers that we don't know, figures that we don't know because people are under the rubbles. 
and the world is still arguing, is it going to be a permanent ceasefire or, um, and there are kidnapped women and, and men who are in Gaza. I think it's about time really uh, uh, to get, I hope that uh, next, in the next few days, we will hear about an agreement to release the hostages and at the same time, um, agree on uh, a ceasefire. Aida, thank you. Um, thank you again, appreciate your experience and uh, the, the huge obstacles you have in your way of getting this message across doing so with grace. And um, this is a question that uh, we'd been asked um, by a couple of staffers. Um, and I want to divert this question actually to the three of you, um, which is from your perspectives, what do conditions on a permanent ceasefire look like beyond the freeing of hostages? Um, so some of you had mentioned uh, conditions that you think were important, but another follow-up question would be, how would you recommend moving forward if Hamas, for example, does not commit to a ceasefire? Um, can we start with Tanya? Is there something that you would like to respond to that question? Um, you know, I, I would say at this moment, it's important to keep in mind, obviously, none of us know about anything uh, that, that that is being discussed. I mean, we're seeing different reports about, you know, who is holding up the negotiations and what the negotiations are based on um, and things like that. So I think that there's obviously a lot of speculation. And, and I think that in any situation, you know, the, the warring parties and their statements should be taken with massive grains of salt. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that, uh, you know, the main thing that we're seeing is reports saying that, you know, Hamas is calling for a total end to the hostilities and Israel doesn't want to agree to that. Um, uh, you know, we're here on this call because we're all calling for a permanent ceasefire. I think it's in Israel's interest to advance a permanent ceasefire. It's in the interest of the hostages that must be freed. It's in the interest of the, the region to, you know, try to start uh, rebuilding and, and rehabilitating. I mean, people are in this ongoing trauma because this is not ending. Um, so, so I think that, you know, that, that specific aspect of it, I would ask people to say, you know, to kind of keep in mind, this isn't Israel's position and Hamas's position. Look at what is in the interest of the people of the region as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Ziva, Ida, would you also like to respond? To go ahead. No, no, no. Just um, I'm trying to. You you asked about which kind of conditions the permanent ceasefire could be, and what if Hamas? Okay. Um. Uh, first of all, I think that um, we have. Oh, we we've been talking how how difficult the situation is, and I spoke about a junction in in that we are standing in now, right now. Uh, I think that we need also to look at it as an opportunity, as um, a possibility for a real uh, a diplomatic, political solution for the situation. Uh, the Palestinian issue, if, if the right wing and Netanyahu managed uh, to do something before the 7th of October, is to marginalize the Palestinian issue and to think that there will be a peace in the region by doing all the Abraham uh, agreements that didn't bring any peace because there wasn't any conflict with those countries uh, uh, from before. But they managed to marginalize the Palestinian issue. Now everybody understands that nobody can ignore the Palestinian issue and that the core problem in the region is the continuation of the occupation. So that will be a chance for not only negotiated freeing the hostages, which is very important, but also a chance to negotiate a real political solution that uh, uh, bring us to a, 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 um, a situation where at least the two-state solution 
everybody is talking about the two state solution. There is one state. Those who want the two state solution should recognize the second state to complete the solution because there is one state. Meanwhile, it's an apartheid state. If it continues like this, which is Israel. If you want really to establish a two-state solution, and I'm telling you, I don't believe that the Israeli government will act in a, 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 from its own free will to reach a political solution. There should be measures taken by the alliance, the, the allies, the main ally, uh, the United States of America, to push for a political solution. And it has to be ending the occupation and and leading to an, uh, uh, the right of self-determination also for the Palestinian. As to the um, what if Hamas do not respect, what if Israel, Israeli government do not respect the ceasefire? I mean, uh, 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 it's, it's a question uh, that uh, everybody is always, even... Putting the question in such a way is is the, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 annoying for me. Because meanwhile, who is practicing or who is uh, implementing this vicious war with all of its crimes is the Israeli side. And, and of course, uh, uh, Hamas might end up in a certain way not uh, obeying. But also Israeli government also can do such a thing. I think there will be mechanisms between those who are negotiating. We have to remember when the situation was less dangerous, less horrible, Hamas respected the agreements and freed 100 uh, hostages. And the uh, and proved again that there is a possibility, not Hamas only, the two sides, and should have understood that the real only way to bring the hostages back and to try to find a solution will be only by negotiations, not by war. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to share, you know, that kind of critique of the question itself. It's been interesting to follow the ceasefire negotiations and see when things are on a standstill, when uh, Israel refuses the conditions, um, there isn't much noise from the administration, but when Hamas refuses conditions, there are public statements. Um, so I think that's a, a good um, uh, an observation. And you know, the next question I, I want to ask uh, Ziv particularly, uh, but also will open if if uh, Aida or Tanya, you have comments, uh, is a bit about the sentiment of Israelis towards a Palestinian state. Um, so one person here had asked that young people in Israel are known to be one of the most right wing of any youth uh, uh group worldwide. So how do you hope to get them to support peace when their attitudes and beliefs can sometimes be very contrary to that? Um, I agree that in Israel, at least, uh, many of the extreme uh, right supporters are young people. And even if you look at the votes, you can see that, for example, uh, soldiers which are at the ages of 18 to 21, I have a lot of supporters uh, for Benvir and Motrich and the extreme. Uh, but we were all young ones. <laughs> we weren't uh, extreme uh, right-wingers, so there's still hope. Um, I think a lot is depending on how, uh, I would say the Israeli government contributes to the, or shapes the, the Israeli discourse, political discourse. And I, we, we've we seen in the recent years, and I think we said that a few times already in this uh, panel, things didn't start in October. They actually started years ago. And uh, especially in recent years, the discourse has been so, um, 
institutions so racist, so violent, and basically, I think erasing Palestinians as humans in a way, uh, dehumanizing Palestinians, especially in Gaza in, and in the West Bank, but also within Israel, sadly. Uh, and I think this is the way to go. So it's really important, I think, to speak up and to not be afraid of the fact that we are all being attacked or oppressed by uh, criticism and so sometimes even threats. Um, trying to show the other way. I tend to be, I'm not a very optimistic uh, person in general, but uh, politically speaking, sometimes I am. Uh, and I do see and talk to people, to a lot of people after October 7th. And I know there's a lot of uh, uh, disillusioned discourse that people saying that they are disillusioned to the right. But I, I hear a lot of people who are disillusioned to the other side, to being more supportive of a political solution, of uh, more understanding and think in the flash that this has been going on for years and we have tried this way, which is the 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 using false way. And we should be more creative and uh, more uh, maybe stubborn about other possibilities. So I think this is the way to go. I don't know. I. I'm not an educator uh, in my uh, professional life, so I don't have the solution to how to change uh, young people's mind. I know there are a lot of organizations and activists and others who are very active on that area. Uh, but I do think there's also an opening, as we all said, there is the life after the seventh is not the same as it was before, not only in, in personal sense, but also in the political sense. So that creates uh, some kind of awakening from the stagnation situation we've been in for a long time. Uh, and that can take uh, to a very horrible uh, situation, which it has been so far. Uh, but I think it's not too late to also uh, uh, witness a shift. And I hope it will. Uh, come first of all to an immediate ceasefire and then gradually uh, to some kind of a political solution which will, I, I agree, it will come uh, maybe very slowly and it will take a lot of patience and time. But I think that is that is also a way to educate the public because once you start negotiations and once you actually sit together, as we've seen in the 90s in Israel, I grew up in the 90s, I remember that very well. It didn't end up very well maybe. But I remember the the optimism and the, and the public discourse. It was different back then, not as racist. Interesting. I I like that the the large scale, the macro discourse can really affect the lives of individuals in the country. Um, Tanya or Ida, would you also like to respond to that question? I just wanted to say, you know, something that we observed um, was that there's been a real spike in the hits to our website in Hebrew. Um, so, you know, we're we're um, the only Israeli organization that focuses on the situation in Gaza. And so a lot of people have come to us, um, like asking what was happening before October 7th, uh, you know, how, how, what, where was the electricity coming from and how many trucks of goods were coming in and all kinds of things like that. So we're seeing those questions kind of in the hits in our website and how many, um, visitors are coming in. So I do think that, um, I, I, I like Zeev, I don't feel particularly optimistic at, at, at the moment, at least in the short term, but I do think that this kind of, um, thirst for more information is to me something that is positive. I do think that unfortunately, most people in this country are kind of told what to think about the situation. Everything is boiled down to these very simplified, uh, you know, slogans and things like that. And there's really little room for, for nuance, for discourse. Um, uh, I agree things are, are incredibly racist. It's, it's really hard to fathom just how much, and it's something that we don't talk about enough, um, uh, you know, about, about Palestinian 
uh, racism and um, and the need for Palestinian safety and security. I mean, these are things that are just completely sort of taboo in our society. So I think that that's um, something to 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 work on. Um, and I do think that you know the international community has a role to play here. I mean, the U.S sort of um, acting as Israel's biggest backer and no matter what happens, kind of still supporting what's happening gives incredible um, force to to this radical extreme right. And so I think that the, the, the US has a real role to play here, also in educating young people um, and, and cl clearly stating where, where the red lines should be. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists to give a one minute final remark. We'll start with Aida, then Ziv, then Tanya. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for hosting us and thank uh, uh, all the people who uh, are listening. Um, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, I think it's very important also, especially because uh, uh, the people are involved and very close to the decision making in the uh, process in the United States of America. Uh, and nowadays, uh, Tanya just finished and said how important the role of the uh, US administration. Uh, it's, it's very important to uh, really believe first of all, that uh, any involvement of the United States should be for the best interest of the people in the region, which means we, uh, it need to lead for a political solution. We need to stop the horrors that are happening. I don't know why the pain of the Palestinians is not that much felt all over the world. There is a process of dehumanization. Um, and uh, I, I can hear the double standards uh, discourse when it comes be, uh, talking about Palestine or talking about Ukraine. Uh, and I think uh, it's about time really to take measures and steps in order to push for this political solution. Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Ziv. So first of all, I also want to thank everyone. Thank you, Delia and Haven, for organizing this and for everyone who participated today. I think we have seen some encouraging steps by the US, uh, especially in regards to settler violence. First, the statements by President Biden, but also the sanctions uh, which are exercised on individuals. And this is a beginning, I hope. Uh, and I, I really wish it would also First of all, it increase all in the West Bank and in regards to settler violence, which is a very disturbing and problematic phenomena, but also towards Israel, not just individuals, but to the policy, to the policy makers, which means the people who control uh, uh, what Israel is conducting or doing, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. Uh, so I I think. We are at a stage where uh, we are being led by a very irresponsible government, a very dangerous government, and uh, whatever the US and the rest of the international community can do, and it's within her pa its power to do to help Israel uh, and the, the entire region to get, a, get out of this horrible and I would say even uh, dark period uh, that would be very meaningful and helpful for for everyone in this region. Thank you, Ziv. Thank you, and Tanya. Um, so I, I guess I'll just use my minute to say, you know, uh, we're seeing U.S. officials push this idea of like a six-week ceasefire. I don't know how they came up with six weeks and not seven or eight or whatever, but I, I just want to say that, um, you know, a, a ceasefire is really the only way to get aid into Gaza. And I think right now there's a, a, you know, across the board consensus that aid needs to get into Gaza quickly at a massive scale. And six weeks is just not enough. It's nothing. And, you know, what we're hearing from Palestinians, of course, is that they don't want to be well fed and then killed. 
um, they need a permanent ceasefire. So um, please to any people on the call who's, uh, uh, you know, uh, members of Congress are still kind of struggling with this question. There's really, there really shouldn't be no struggle at all. Um, a, a permanent ceasefire is really the only way to prevent um, or sorry, not to prevent, to mitigate what is already a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Thank you to the three of you so, so much. Um, you're all doing incredible work on the ground and keep it coming. And I, I definitely recommend folks to uh, reach out uh, to Ziv or Tanya um, or Ida <laughs> if you have further questions on West Bank escalations, on Gaza escalations, and on the Israeli Knesset escalations. Um, and I want to thank all those who came uh, today to listen for coming. Keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a recording of this briefing and further resources. Um, if you have any questions for panelists, you can email kvan at demandprogress.org. That is C-A-V-A-N at demandprogress.org and uh, keep an eye out for invites to future events and briefings in this series. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.